morning, everyone. It is 10 o'clock. I'm just going to give a few more seconds to let people get situated here, um, and then we will start. Alrighty, it is a little past 10. So let's get some housekeeping stuff out of the way and um, let people join in the next couple of minutes. So like I said, good morning. This is Katie Feeling, um, and I will just be kind of in the background um, helping out. And you have joined the network lighting controls in schools. And it is May 4th, Armando. <laughs> Denoted that right there. A special day. A special day. There you go. May the fourth be with you. <laughs> All right. So here's the housekeeping stuff. If you if you haven't attended one of our webinars before, um, you're all gonna be on mute. But in that, at least on my computer, it's on the right hand side. There's all the menu options. Um, you can ask questions in the question box or in the chat, I believe. Um, there's going to be pauses. Um, Armando will address your questions and a few online polls, which are kind of fun to see what everybody what everybody thinks. So uh, participate in those. It's fun. And then after the webinar, there's going to be a short survey. It's just a few questions um, to help us when we um, um, develop more content. There's also going to be a recording. It's being recorded right now, just so you know. Um, uh, and the slide deck that Armando is going through, those will both be posted to our web page. Um, and there is our general email address that you can write to if you've got comments or questions after the, well, I, or during the webinar if you don't want to ask them. Uh, and just as a, as a reminder, um, Lighting Design Lab is part of Seattle City Light and has been for decades. <laughs> we work with sort of three different groups that uh, intersect with each other, and we are at the center. Um, the end use customers, trade allies, and design allies, we try to make our content um, accessible for all three of these groups. Um, because I, really everybody needs to work together to, to save some energy. And besides education and training, we also do technology evaluation. Um, in fact, Armando is going to go out, I think, this week, right, to do a, a consult for a restaurant. Thursday. Thursday, all right. Um, and on our website, we've got lots of tools and resources um, in our, in our um, newsletter. Uh, Eric and Sean will often have little um, tidbits, you know, tips and tricks and stuff that that uh, they write. And we also do information aggregation, um, which like the um, the webinar that Armando did a couple weeks ago, um, showcasing some winners of the, oh my gosh, now I just forgot what it was called. Lighting, Lighting Homes for Tomorrow competition. Light <laughs> and Homes for Tomorrow, yes. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Katie, getting us started over here. A uh, little bit about me. Let me get my webcam going here. All right. Hello. A uh, little bit about me. Schooling in uh, computer science and engineering helped me understand uh, network lighting controls, uh, NLCs, as we're going to refer to them, integration, as well as the commercial lighting industry. Uh, my career started working with a network lighting controls manufacturer in Pennsylvania, uh, first as engineering uh, support for their residential and commercial products, then as a inside sales, developing projects and, and submitting bids nationally for, for controls projects. Uh, I then worked with a market partner for this NLC manufacturer, working on the retrofit market in the northeast of the United States. And now I've been working at uh, the Lighting Design Lab after, as their technical development supervisor, working a lot with utilities, the lighting industry, standards groups, technical committees. So it's, it's been fun, you know, getting plugging the ear to the ground and understanding uh, how we can catalyze the adoption of these emerging connected lighting technologies. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, uh, but in a school setting. 
Today, we are going to be understanding how and applying network planning control hardware and features. We are going to get knowledge to ask the right questions to implement common control strategies in schools, as well as understand what those control strategies are. Uh, we're gonna see how to leverage utility resources and incentives and navigating the financial and operational conversations for network lighting control projects. Uh, before we really dive in, I wanted to see who is here with us. Uh, we're going to start with our, just our first poll, talking a little bit about you. Uh, so please, you know, participate and engage in our polls. It, it helps us uh, get get more out of this, and and we want to see who who is joining us here today. So thank you for those that are already jumping in. All right, I'm going to keep it on for like a few more seconds. Okay, so let's share this out over here. A uh, nice little mix. Uh, Good amount of product specifiers, designers, uh, utilities, manufacturers. All right, well, thank you for joining us today, everybody. Uh, let's start, why are we here? We're here for the, for the smiles, for the kids. We're here to implement network lighting control technologies in schools for the people. Uh, not necessarily worrying as much about the space and the savings because if you design well for people, the savings will come. Uh, how are we going to be doing this? We're going to, again, understand how to leverage utility incentives, how to be, how to design spaces to be flexible and purposeful, reducing glare and operating hours, and ultimately reducing that energy bill. And what are we going to be doing? We are going to be implementing network lighting control projects in schools, what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, I'm going to be starting with the note on, hey, the odds have been stacked against network lighting controls, where both decision makers and groups of stakeholders have had their sh fair share of bad experiences uh, with controls projects or have heard about horror stories about controls projects, uh, whether they're expensive or troublesome to install, expensive to maintain. Let me get a pointer going here. You know, everyone remembers having to pretty much press Morse code in order to get uh, your, your switch programmed or having to go into the ceiling to, to switch the dip switches on a sensor in order to make the change, the timer or the sensitivity. And even when wireless control started to, to come to light, you know, they, their connection sometimes was not the best or was not as reliable. And even when sensors even functioned the right way and lights change unexpectedly for the users, they were defeated by the technological Dixie cup. So we know that it's, it's the odds have been stacked against network lighting controls because they've had a very rough road. Uh, you know, they've had their fair share of issues, but they have matured. It is a lot smoother nowadays. Uh, good news is that they are ready for prime time. Uh, mainly, and today we're going to mainly talk about mid-size scalable wireless network lighting control system. Um, and, and a good amount of their features today, you know, we're, we're going to explore how they future proof a space. They can be, you know, network lighting controls. Do you have smart devices in the ceiling? You have power in the ceiling. They're going to be serving as the infrastructure for the emerging technologies of tomorrow. Uh, and, and yes, uh, mention more so wireless, uh, mainly because they're number one, very uh, uh, much more easier to implement. They save a lot of money in labor costs alone, not having to run dimming wires or, or different zoning wires all across your ceiling and even just going in your ceiling as well. Um, wireless systems also allow for more flexible architecture. There's various protocols that allow for integration. And I know that there's many different range options. You know, uh, wireless systems have been a lot more reliable and better connected, even, even though construction has concrete and metal. Uh, there's a good amount of best practices and, and applications that, that will defeat the metal boxes around these systems. Um, today, the majority of savings uh, that we see on lighting products come from the LED adoption, you know, changing from legacy sources like fluorescence, incandescence, metal halides into LEDs. And yes, though, those are going to be the great savings for our projects. But, uh, and that's because we are still learning how to apply network lighting controls. The idea is that as we understand how they work better, as we optimize systems, as we get more aggressive with these control strategies and their, and their implementation, 
the more savings that we're going to get. First and foremost, we want to, again, design spaces for the people, for the students, the teachers, the staff. Uh, and if you do it well for, for the people, again, the savings will come. And as I say, and yeah, savings and, and, and code compliance, as well as some rebates are, are some of those features that are, that are going to be the main uh, drivers for implementing network lighting controls. But there's a lot of other emerging technologies, especially with the internet of things, IOT, that are gonna be becoming a lot more mainstream in the years to come. And uh, what we call not lighting controls that, that have these smart features that are able to flip the switch. And, and, and turn on the features for these, for, for these new technologies. Uh, and, and if you implement network lighting controls today, you don't have to turn on these features. You simply uh, more often than not have to pay a software or a license fee to turn on, be it asset tracking, uh, space utilization, path, uh, path finding, all these features can be turned on in a future date after installing the system. That's gonna be, playing a key role on, on the adoption for these systems and technologies. So let's get a couple of uh, semantics terms and talk about the control strategies for network lighting controls. Uh, first, foremost, head tomato, tomato. Let's talk about the naming nomenclature. We've heard the term advanced lighting controls that was used more so in the past because the idea of networked or network lighting controls was associated with uh, IT where people in the IT departments would, would say, oh, each component is gonna require an IP address, it's gonna block down our, our client's network, it's gonna be a security issue. So that's why the word network wasn't necessarily uh, a, an ad adopted term, but it, it isn't until recently that we really drove the point that it's no, it's not that each device or it's each fixture is going to require an IP address. When we say networked, we just mean that it's communicating, that we can configure and reconfigure the system in a very easy way. And uh, most of these systems, sure, will have one device going on the network. It's mainly the processor, the brain, or the hub of the system. And uh, that, that eases the strain on the IT department. Uh, luminaire level lighting controls, they are a sub-strategy, a subset strategy of network lighting controls. Those are going to be your smart fixtures, and we're going to talk a little bit more about them in, in, in a few moments, but just wanted to address the term ahead of time. Uh, more general umbrella terms, your lighting controls or controls when you're talking in lighting projects, also good. But yeah, NLC or network lighting controls is that term to go with. And when we're talking about standalone controls, those are those that are not going to be easily reconfigured. Those are the ones that are more analog, like that that uh, relay, the sensor with the relay in the ceiling or, or the dimmer that doesn't really communicate with anything else. Those are the standalone controls. Um, starting us on with, with uh, more controls terminology, we're talking here about the control, the zone. Or the, or the control channel. So, so the zone, when it comes to lighting controls, is the fundamental indivisible unit of control for lighting systems. It's important to understand how to optimize the control zoning for the visual needs, not necessarily electrical needs, not what's convenient for the wires, but what's convenient for the user to be seeing in a space. And, and, and obviously the zone is a group of fixtures that are controlled together and you cannot subdivide the zone into more parts. Uh, more zones in a space, they do provide more flexibility. And a typical example for a room-based uh, system with zoning is depicted with, with letters and plans, as you see here. You know, hey, you know, A, a is going to be this entire row of, of linear lights here. B is going to be this the, the last uh, linear fixture on that row. You see other zones for, for like the the projector or the whiteboard in the space is zoned to itself. The teacher's desk has a zone. Uh, by the windows or, or, or sinks. If you have a lab, you'll have a zone on its own. And, and they are, again, designed to be, uh, the groups of fixtures are gonna be designed to work together. And, and as you see in the plan here, uh, designated by these letters and, and easy enough to read and follow. So what controls these zones? On a zone-based network lighting control systems, the load controllers are these devices that control zone. And these are for non-luminaire level lighting control applications. Um, they, they come in many flavors, these load controllers. Uh, 
for and and ubiquitously or the the most common flavor for dimming is a zero to ten volt dimming load controller. Um, they are a piece of gear that will respond to all other system inputs such as wall station, time clock events, sensors as we're going to be talking about in a little bit. Um, and note, these load controllers can come in flavors from one amp that will just control one fixture or, or, or a couple to like, you know, 20 amps of controlling a large open office, things along those lines as well. Um, so a zone controller wall station. These are wall controls that will typically just uh, control one zone. So that one group of fixtures is not gonna be subdivided into more. Um, and users, the zone controllers are great for personal or individual control. Uh, it might raise some issues in, in open offices if you have zone controllers because open offices usually have uh, more than one zone. And if you start shifting them, you're gonna be bothering other occupants in that open office that don't want the levels to be changed. Um, usually tenants can dim up and down with these uh, zone controllers with dedicated raise and lower buttons or sliders, as you see in the images there. The and the more and the more control users have ultimately at the end of the day, they'll they'll usually not have lights at the brightest level because they're they're gonna see that as too gla glary or too bothersome. So it's great to give again personal control to the people. So scene multi-scene or preset controllers, they are slightly more complex uh, wall stations. <laughs> And scenes are an aggregation of control zones at specific levels, coupled with the fading rate. So you can have, you know, zones A through E. Zone A is going to be at 100. Zone B is going to be at 60. Zone C is going to be at 45. And when, uh, and that's going to be that, that setup for that scene. So when you press that button in two seconds, all the lights are going to come to that what we call scene. Uh, the scene configuration usually is, is configured with what we call commissioning tools, uh, more commonly now being operated with uh, phones or tablets and, and smart apps. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about scene preferences in a little bit, but it's just important to note that scenes will have uh, different zones at specific levels, and that's how they get configured. Uh, now moving on to control strategies, and we're going to talk about this one. It's very important: high-end trim, or also known as a task tuning. Uh, and high-end trim is the ability to reduce the maximum light output. So put a ceiling or a cap on the maximum light output that a fixture can can produce. Uh, and it happens uh, because fixtures are usually uh, conservatively ordered brighter than they need to be for their space and and correctly so because people that are specifying fixtures won't know if the colors of the walls and the ceilings are going to be darker or there's going to be obstructions or there's going to be something on site that is going to prevent uh just the illumination to be as bright as it needs to be so they're so fixtures are usually uh overly bright from what they need to be uh so a, a great way to then if you don't need that brightness, you look at the Illuminating Engineering Society or the IES's recommended light levels. And that's what we have an example of here on the left-hand side. The IES is a, a great governing body for lighting and they develop all these studies and, and they've come around with the calculus of lighting and they come with what is the correct light levels that we need for different tasks. Uh, and, and we can see those as foot candles or in Europe, uh, you'll see lux as, as a unit of measurement that they use. So to get to those foot candles, uh, we know what the light level needs to be. And if we're, for example, at a, at a, at a desk uh, is around 30 foot candles that you need. And if your lights at full bright go to 60 foot candles, oh, oh my God, that's almost double the amount of uh, illumination that you need. So with high end trim, you can again, cap that maximum output, be able to deliver the correct light levels that your task planes and it's gonna be less glary and more comfortable for the people involved. Not to mention, whenever you reduce that ceiling for lighting, you save a lot of energy, especially you know, with thousands of fixtures in a school or a project. If all of them have high-end trim, uh, again, great, great savings to be had. Moving on to, to motion control and motion sensors. Uh, the idea is that, hey, for, for occupancy, lights will turn 
turn on automatically if people are detected or, uh, in a space. And after no one is, de is, is detected in a space after a certain amount of time, the lights will turn off. Uh, for vacancy, there's, there's, there's a slight difference. The lights will not turn on automatically, but rather you need to turn the lights on, be it another, be it a wall station, be it a time clock event, or another way to turn on lights. But the idea is that when the room is vacant, uh, the lights will turn off after a certain period of time. Uh, and sensors, they can be mounted in the ceiling, so having 360 degrees of view. They can be mounted in walls. Uh, that's great, especially when you have vertical obstructions. There are hallway sensors that throw beams uh, of, of coverage very, very deep, like 1,000 or 1,500 uh, feet. Uh, you can also mount, mount sensors in corners, getting more uh, a peripheral view of, 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 of a space. And it's very important, as you see in the bottom right image, to understand coverage. You, for example, the you have a, a wall sensor here in this space that has a bookcase, and it's covering the the desk in the space here. Well, in the coverage, when, whenever there's a person working here, the lights will continuously turn off because the sensor does not have the coverage to look at this human. Uh, sensors come in. Uh, two very common types. There, there's more, but these are the two most common types, passive infrared and ultrasonic. Passive infrared works with uh, just the heat that the people uh, produce in line of sight. Uh, again, the, when, when sensors detect heat motion, they're, they're going to know that there's occupancy in the space. And these sensors can be wireless because they can be run off a battery. They don't need as much power as the other flavor, flavor uh, ultrasonic. These ultrasonic sensors, they, they, uh, they rely on a sonar wave that pulses out every few seconds, and this causes them to require constant power. Uh, and thus, they cannot be part of a wireless system. They're going to need to be powered with line voltage and wired throughout, throughout their usage. And you have dual tech sensors that do a little bit of both. Good to know with ultrasonic sensors is they don't need line of sight to function or to detect occupancy. They're great for bathrooms, especially when there's stalls. And you, you'll have people, uh, again, not directly in the line of sight of the sensor, but the sonar waves will detect people behind stalls and walls and, and restrooms. Again, they use sonar waves just like bats. Daylight harvesting. Uh, we leverage the, uh, the daylight availability. If we think back a little bit to the to the high-end trim slide that had the recommended light levels, well, if daylight from a window can get me 80% of the way there, then I only need 20% of electrical light to get me to that to that uh, recommended light level for my task. Uh, so again, daylighting will will ensure that lights are, are at a dim, dimmer level and that they are uh, less glary and more comfortable for, for the people. Um, important to note about daylighting in a networked lighting control, zone-based configuration, there's a lot of uh, considerations when it comes to how to program or set up daylighting. Uh, depending on, on your window opening, you need what they call a primary daylight zone as well as a secondary daylight zone. And we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of this uh, when we talk about luminar level lighting controls. But uh, there's a good amount of wiring that, that happens with, with daylighting when and responding to, for example, you need to have a primary daylight zone that's gonna be immediately close to your window and the secondary one is gonna be slightly behind it. And they all need to respond to a sensor in this space. So again, a little bit more thinking uh, when it comes to programming or commissioning daylighting. Uh, time clock programming uh, it is the ability to turn lights on and off or send them to levels at either a time of day, say you know 1 p.m., 5 p.m., or astronomically, the these systems are able to respond to sunrise or sunset, or like you see in the image here, you know, hey, five minutes after, 10 minutes before sunrise or sunset. Uh, so these are great for, for, for dawn and dusk operations. Uh, and obviously the time of day can, can be great. Hey, you know, school opens at 7 a.m. So at 7 a.m. we want lights to be at a background level of like 20% as people start coming into the school, things along those lines. 
Uh, what's a very powerful feature that time clocks are doing these days are also setting the occupancy sensor behavior. Uh, things that are that are good strategies to implement with time clock programming. For example, these days you can do, oh, during school hours, let's say 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, I want my occupancy sensors to turn lights on to, let's say, and sure, 100% when, when they're occupied in a zone, but I don't want lights to go off just for safety reasons. So from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., whenever the sensors detect vacancy, we're going to go to, let's say, 25% uh, output, you know, keeping at a very low background level for people to be able to move around the school. Uh, but outside of school hours, sure, when, when lights are occupied, when the space is occupied, sure, turn the lights on to the brighter 80, 100% level, and then turn the lights off outside of school hours. So a good strategy to implement with, with time clock programming paired with occupancy control. Um, Load shed and demand response. I just wanted to mention it's not as it's not necessarily seen as much in Seattle or the, uh, just yet. Yeah, this is uh, very much more applicable to California as it's required by code. But demand response is is comes from utilities where where utilities are seeing a a the load usage rise is from all their buildings, all their uh, commercial residential customers are drawing in so much load, be it, you know, a hot summer, everyone's cranking up their AC or a cold winter, everyone's cranking up their, their heaters. And, and the utility is seeing, oh no, so many customers' buildings are, are using so much power, I'm gonna need to call a few of them and to reduce their load. So network lighting control systems are able to take a demand response signal, be it an analog contact closure, whether it be a digital, you know, building management system signal or a simple Wi-Fi connection signal that's being sent out. <laughs> network lighting control systems today can take this signal and do, for example, a, a global sweep. Like, hey, all dimmable loads come down 30%. Or you can go room by room and program what is going to be the demand response level for that space. And it's a great way for utilities to quickly send out a signal and for buildings and schools to respond and lower the energy by a vast amount. When you compound those strategies, it looks something along these lines. You know, you'll have occupancy, vacancy, turning off lights, you have, uh, you know, the time of day, if you have enough daylight, you don't need as much light as well. If high end trim is going to be capping the, the ceiling of the lights. So you end up saving a lot of energy when you implement network lighting control strategies at a great, greater scale. And there's even a lot more strategies. When you give people personal control, be it in offices or in classrooms, people are gonna again change, shift the, the light levels and, and ideally save energy. You have demand response, uh, but you can also implement other things like plug load control taking care of those phantom loads like printers or microwaves when, they, when you know, the building is not in use, saves a lot more energy as well. Circadian control, we're gonna talk a little bit about what light and health is in a little bit, uh, but circadian control also will, will affect the lighting levels. And if you pair a lighting system with shades, you, know, you can open and close shades to allow daylight to come in. You can also uh, pair a system with an, with an HVAC system and again, save more energy or make the space more comfortable for the people inside. So the lighting controls and integration offer a great many strategies to number one, provide comfort, number two, meet code, and number three, save that energy. So where do savings come from? And, and that's when we talk about the birds and the bees. Uh, sorry, that's a, a terrible joke, but uh, what, where do we get, you know, our, our, our savings? So we're, we're Thinking here on the right-hand side at, at energy. We see energy as, as, a, as a product of power and time. How much power you're using for how much time? And the unit of measurement that we have is a kilowatt hour. That means, you know, a thousand watts per hour. Uh, you see at the bottom here, an example of, hey, per kilowatt hour, here's what a, a medium general service building is going to be charged. Uh, that's, you know, those are 2019, 2020 numbers. But, but per kilowatt hour is how utilities bill you in your system. So when you reduce your kilowatt, that and that usually happens when you convert a space from, from old sources, fluorescence, incandescence into LED, you reduce the wattage. 
and you reduce the run hours by adding network lighting controls. That's again, your time clock turning off lights, your occupancy sensor detecting vacancy, turning off lights, daylight harvesting, not needing as much light, so dimming the level of light. So you're reducing, again, both with LEDs and controls, you reduce both the kilowatt and the hours that you use for, for, for your systems, and that's where your savings will be coming from. If you want whole numbers, when you turn to LEDs, you'll you'll save somewhere between 50 to 75% reduction. And when you add controls, you can save another 50 to 75% on top of that. So did you know about luminaire level lighting controls? We've mentioned them before, and they are again a subset of network lighting controls. And they have four main uh, characteristics. One, they are individually addressable. So each fixture can be its own uh, zone and they can be grouped again with many other features to form a larger zone. But it is all done with the configuration tool or your programming application and uh, not gonna be changed by your building occupants or your tenants. They have integrated occupancy and daylight sensors. Uh, so again, both occupancy and daylight for each fixture They'll allow continuous dimming. So they have the, each fixture is gonna have an integral load controller dimming the driver from you know, 100 to 0%. And they're gonna be networkable. Again, not necessarily meaning that each fixture is gonna have an IP address, but rather that each fixture is, is gonna be programmed and reprogrammed easily through the configuration tool. Uh, you see here again, you know, your network lighting control, you have your load controller, the daylight sensor, your occupancy sensor, and in the LLLC luminaire level lighting control application, you have all these into one fixture. That's why we say the one to many or one to one approach. Your NLC zone base will have one occupancy sensor, one daylight sensor, one load controller for many fixtures. And the one to one LLLC is like, hey, you have one sensor and one load controller for each for one fixture. Uh, a great many labor savings when it comes to LLLC, only changing out fixtures in a space rather than having to install load controllers, wire them, a daylight sensor, wire the, the daylight zones and occupancy sensors. So you're saving a good amount of labor, a good amount of uh, less hardware as well. And again, since each, each fixture is smart, it opens the doors for those uh, emerging IoT technologies that are gonna be coming in. And as a bonus, LLLC uh, fixtures automatically meet code. We have a snippet here of the 2018 Washington state, as well as in, in the same language in the Seattle uh, energy code where hmm, for lighting controls uh, and the, the fact that they're using the LLLC language is another tip in the hat that this is not going away anytime soon. It's gonna be an integral part of buildings in the future. But when we have open offices for over 5,000 square feet, they're gonna require luminaire level lighting controls. So already in open offices, over 5,000 square feet that are gonna be renovated, they're gonna require LLLC applications. Uh, and outside of open offices, uh, you know, for all areas, LLLC that can monitor, you know, do motion sensing, that can do daylight sensing, and can be reconfigured so they're networked, uh, that's, and that's the language that they're using, the same as, as the characteristics for LLLC. They're gonna require luminaire level lighting controls in code. Uh, obviously, if you do not have uh, luminaire level lighting controls in your spaces, you're gonna need to follow a lot more uh, code specific requirements for occupancy, daylight, time control, and, and they'll always require wall stations and, and, and light reduction controls for wall stations in your spaces. So this is an example of how luminaire level lighting controls can operate uh, in a space. So we have considered, you know, a, a, an open office where, hey, uh, at 7 a.m. people are coming into this to this office, open office, and and lights are not going to necessarily be on bright. They're going to be at a background level, say 20 percent. That's going to allow. Uh, the adaptive visual compensation. People are coming from the outside and it's not gonna be, at 7 a.m. it's not gonna be as bright yet. So when they come into the into the space, it's not gonna get a very bright or glary room that's gonna shock people. So no, it's gonna be more comfortable. And as people walk into their 
offices are going to be occupied and the lights are going to know, hey, we have an occupant below in their desk. Let's let's raise the light level to maybe something brighter, like 80, so they can see what they're doing. But when people are not in their spaces, they haven't arrived to work yet or, or whatever the case may be, let's keep the light at the background level. It saves energy, but ultimately keeps the space more comfortable. Same thing happens as people leave. You know, when people leave, the lights go and go back down to that background level, and the people that are still at their desk will have the brighter level. And only when everyone leaves is that is then when the lights turn off in the space. And that's kind of and and even before you program these fixtures, this luminary level lighting control fixtures, some uh, some of this programming will already be baked in by default. Uh, so great strategies to have as well. Uh, sorry that I've been going on and on about luminaire level lighting control technology. We really like it at, at the Light and Design Lab. But wanted to hear from you. Next poll, if you've had experiences with luminaire level lighting control technology. Uh, so launching another poll here, please can participate. I want to just catch what you're thinking when it comes to LLLC. Are these technologies sometimes uh, your go-to solution? Are you not sure about using luminaire level lighting controls in projects? Uh, are you slightly hesitant? Is it more a discussion with your clients? So thank you for those that are answering the poll. I'm gonna keep it open for about five more seconds. All right, thank you very much. Let me close it. And I appreciate there is there there is a better feeling with this crowd that we've seen. So, hey, you know, discuss it with the stakeholders, or it's, if it's not specified, we won't bring it up. But it, hey, at least a good forty percent think it could be a go-to solution. So it's a great a great take on that. Um, as we continue going along, are there any questions? And, and I don't think there are. But again, you can use the chat feature if you want to have a question or comment. So feel free to keep engaging. So a couple of things to note before getting these projects started. Um, use your resources, especially if you're here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, there's what they call a trade ally network Northwest that Ha they have, uh, you know, uh, lighting trainings, HVAC trainings. They also pair you with resources to help uh, assess what your potential for energy savings is in a building. Uh, lighting Design Lab, we can do consult project-specific consults. Uh, Integrated Design Lab for the University of Washington, they can help with daylighting calculations. Uh, utilities, and we're going to dig a bit more about how utilities can help you later, but they can provide great customer service, great technical support and, and projects. So tap into your to your network and in, in your energy efficiency network when it comes to lighting in your space. There's a lot of even uh, free or very low cost services that many organizations provide. One of these uh, items uh, that that these resources can do is a lighting audit. If you're not familiar with a lighting audit, it is a great way to benchmark what you have in your space. Uh, lighting auditors will go to your building and they'll come together with every, they'll count every fixture, lamp, control, and they'll set it up in either a software tool or, or a great spreadsheet knowing, hey, they have all these, you know, T, T12 fluorescents in back of house spaces and, and you know, if you outline all of your all of your lamps in your space, you can then uh, try out many different options as to what your solutions can be. Uh, these audits can be leveraged to map out again uh, multiple solutions. Your existing lighting and control infrastructure. Uh, there's a, there's usually many unknowns in buildings, especially in schools that have older spaces that usually don't get uh, entered into. And just knowing what you have is a great way to, again, benchmark and see the potential savings when you're looking at, hey, turning into LED and adding controls that are going to reduce the operating hours of the space. If you see on the right-hand side here, when you have an audit, you can talk about uh, your savings from, from, hey, just changing out existing lighting to LEDs, uh, what utility savings I can get from just, you know, saving, uh, reducing the wattage. There's also going to be lamp 
and ballast uh, savings in the sense that fluorescent fixtures, they burn out a lot quicker than LEDs do and ballast as well because they're re reaching their end of life. So that does come into play when you're looking at uh, not having to replace all the lamps, not having to replace the ballast. Um, there's always, you know, when you're when you're benchmarking your system, you can also calculate, hey, if I work with the utility and I implement the solutions they want and meet the requirements, what is the rebate that the utility is going to get me? So all these considerations can start at the lighting audit. Um, value engineering. Interestingly enough, most other building contractors like to upsell to a better system, to, to hardware with more bells and whistles and more reliable. But electrical contractors will be one of those few that will downsell. Like, oh, we, we can do something along these lines for a lot cheaper if we use these other materials. You don't need new fixtures. You can just replace your, t you replace your, your lamp with T-LEDs and, and maybe add some sensors. Uh, that sounds great when we're talking about upfront costs. But as the system gets implemented and you're not getting those savings, you don't have a flexible control or a flexible system in your space, you're gonna ultimately lose a lot of value. Uh, because value engineering, they're looking to remove features and hardware that extend the life of the system because the less you run uh, lights, the less heat, heat they generate and the more or the longer they can last. True value engineering uh, can add even to the upfront cost uh, but ultimately reducing costs from the life cycle of how, of how long the system is used. Because these systems don't go anywhere. They, they last 10, 15, 20 plus years these days. So the better it is designed up front, uh, the more savings and the more features you can add at, at, at the latter end. Uh, and also when you value engineer, you, you may run the risk of not meeting utility requirements incentive savings. Uh, I want to talk about a little bit about cybersecurity considerations. It is an ever increasing issue with all building systems, be it both wired or wireless. Um, that being said, even with any lighting project that's going to require a hub to go on the network, we want to ensure that the IT department is involved early. Um, there are new, there are many cybersecurity standards, but the one, the most common one that we're looking at is UL 2900. I'm not necessarily gonna go deep into it. Just note that the Qualifying Body Design Lights Consortium looks at UL 2900 as well as other cybersecurity standards to say, hey, these, this system has some type of testing against cybersecurity risks and threats, and they deem it you know, better prepared and, and less vulnerable to attacks and hacks. Now that I mentioned DLC, the Design Lights Consortium, again, they are a, a qualifying body for both hardware and systems. And they say this fixture or this control is a good control because we have vetted it against our requirements. They met our requirements, so they get our stamp of approval. Many utilities look at the Design Lights Consortium uh, to see, hey, if we are going to qualify, if we're going to incentivize uh, different systems or products, we want a qualifying body like the DLC to give them a stamp, and that's what utilities look at to, to start the process of, of incentivizing the system. They have what they call their, their qualified products list for network lighting controls. That's the circle over there. And it looks a little bit like this. It's a little heavy, but on the left-hand side, you're gonna have the different systems from the different manufacturers. And on the top row, you're gonna have the different features. You say, hey, occupancy sensing, do they have daylight harvesting? Do they do high-end trim? No, the yeses and all of this. Uh, do they have luminaire level lighting control? See a good mix of yeses and nos. And at the very last uh, column here, cybersecurity, you know, what systems are, are vetted with cybersecurity considerations and which don't. So again, looking at the Design Lights Consortium as a qualifying body, similar to Energy Stars, another qualifying body, but understanding the requirements and seeing how they vet products and what and how they rank their products, it could be illuminating when, when picking up what systems to use.
Understanding code requirements for products is very important as well, where you're gonna first note, when is code going to apply to your project? Because code can apply in new construction as well as some tenant improvements and renovation projects. And you need to meet code to certify uh, for occupancy in a building. Do you have your occupancy certificate? It's important to note is the fact that various uh, space types will have wattage allowed per square foot. Uh, so again, code allows, hey, you can have, uh, you know, 0.64 watts per square foot in, in, in an office or, or, and there are many ways, and there's two main ways that code reads the wattage per square foot. One is, is uh, for a whole building. So you see uh, on, on the cursor here, you know, automatic automotive facilities, convention centers, courthouse, you'll have uh, per the square foot of your building, how much wattage they'll allow. Or you can do what they call the space by space method. Rather than doing the whole building, you'll go, hey, in a dining area or electrical mechanical rooms, uh, guest rooms, laboratories, how much wattage per square foot can you have in these space types? Uh, and again, both lighting and lighting controls will fall into this by capping the, uh, the, the ceiling like high-end trim or changing your LEDs. It'll be helping you meet these, uh, they call lighting power densities in code. And again, utilities will, if they don't have any specific incentives, they'll, they usually look at code and say, hey, if you beat code, if you are 10% below code, we're gonna incentivize you this much for your energy efficiency project. When you're thinking about implementers, your manufacturers, your rep agencies, uh, tap into their knowledge because they're usually very knowledgeable. Manufacturers, they usually have this global industry knowledge and they're great to provide technical advisory of what emerging technologies are out there. What are the best practices to implement systems these days? Uh, you're, and, and they work a lot with rep representatives in, in specific territories that they'll know how to operate uh, in their own region. You know, who, who are the different electrical contractors they work with? What are their, their supply chain expectations? They're great for local coordination. Uh, and we want to leverage that that brain power, you know, different manufacturers have procedural tools like, hey, you know, quick quoting tools or project development tools that can help uh, develop the construction documents. But you, you can also learn which manufacturers can package uh, the system by rooms like, hey, classroom one, classroom two, classroom three, all packed in their own individual boxes, all sent. So, so the contractors that are gonna install the system just have to take their, the boxes to the correct rooms and pack everything there rather than everything being in pallets. Some manufacturers will prepare a space. For example, hey, the load controller for room A is gonna be, tied, is gonna be prepared to the wall station. So as soon as they get powered on, they're gonna respond to one another. And even some manufacturers go beyond and pre-commission. So if you have, uh, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, a sequence of operations that tells the manufacturer what the control intent is for each space they may already pre-program some of that functionality even before it's shipped out so these procedural efficiencies are great to take note of and knowing which manufacturer can do what uh, before implementing a project is, is is great knowledge to have so plugging into your territory utilities Utilities are actively looking to reduce the customer's load via energy efficiency methods and are promoting efficient emerging, emerging, emerging technologies as well as best practices for implementation so that utilities will have this, this, very, this good know-how on best practices and, and the emerging technologies that you can tap into your utilities. They usually have, uh, for example, Seattle City Light has their energy advisors that is a number and an email you can reach for questions on efficiency projects and utilities uh, across the nation will just have a similar department or similar team that will help on, hey, if you have questions on implementing a project, ask them and they can get you started or pointed in the right direction. Utilities also want to remain relevant to the adoption of these emerging IoT technologies as they'll ultimately be more connected to their customer buildings and their spaces going forward. A big part of what utilities are doing is uh, being very connected with the energy usage of their buildings. Um, there will be a growing trend of more grid interactive and efficient buildings in the very near future. And utilities want to work with their customers to get there. 
the more connected utilities are with the load being used in other buildings, the better they can control and ensure there's no blackouts, there's no brownouts, and there's enough energy to go around. One way that utilities are doing this is by, again, providing incentives and rebates. Uh, and utility programs these days have been evolving, allow, allowing more incentives for LED fixtures and network lighting controls. The workbooks are seeing more prescriptive or upfront fixed savings when it comes to controls rather than, oh, if you beat code by this much or if your performance is good, no. Upfront fixed or deemed savings are where these utility programs are evolving into. They leverage regional control savings factors. That's what you see on the left-hand side here. Uh, different government bodies or effic energy efficiency bodies will be conducting studies as to what uh, different control technologies will have in different savings for each for, for space type for example you have a hey, break rooms classrooms hallways and and the utilities are plugging into the studies of hey we expect nlc systems to say 40 percent in hallways 25 percent in classrooms same with luminaire level lighting controls so that's how utilities are able to pay uh incentives up front because they'll have workbooks with these pre-built values and and if you're implementing you know llc in a break room and you expect 60 percent savings that's what your your program workbook is going to develop in that incentive um and not only that many utilities are giving a bonus kicker such as 50 to 75 dollar incentive bonus for luminaire level lighting controls it's very ubiquitous here in the pacific northwest but we also see that it's going to be a growing trend across the nation and because we're part of sales city light i want to talk a little bit about the seattle's 50 dollar fixture incentive requirements You want to start with the Design Light Consortium, the DLC Network Lighting Control QPL. So that, that uh, larger spreadsheet that I showed earlier, we want to ensure that the network lighting control system that you're using is qualified by the DLC. That's, that's where everything starts. Uh, they want to ensure in this program that if, if applicable, you have high interim occupancy and daylight harvesting programmed on your LLLC or network lighting control systems. For non-LLLC, you're gonna require a minimum of two zones per 300 square feet. Uh, before install on a project, City Light's gonna require a sequence of operation, which we'll talk in a little bit, as well as floor plans for the project. After the system has been installed, you're gonna require the as-built documents and that uh, inspection or site visit. What City Light will not allow on their program are T-LEDs. And when you do have fixtures under 20 watts, but still have the LLLC technology on them, they do what they call a prorated incentive. The best way I can explain it is saying, hey, a 10 watt fixture will, will give you $25 of the incentive uh, because you know, you're know you under 10, you're under 20 watts and, and half of your, you know, let's say your fixture will have 10 watts. And if your full incentive is 50, but you're only using half of the wattage that you're gonna require as a minimum, then you'll get half of the incentive. So again, if you had you know, five watts, it would be $12.50 that you would have to your incentive. So if you are not going to be using the $50 fixture incentive, you will otherwise get a 15 cent per kilowatt hour on both fixture and control savings. Uh, talking for a little bit, wanted to just get a quick sanity check and asking people to select the benefits of a lighting audit. Uh, I think you can only pick one, one option here on this poll. It should have been many options, but if you can help select, hey, what's your favorite, favorite benefit of a lighting audit? So you can humor me here and, 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 and participate on our poll. Thank you so much. Sorry, I was taking a, a water break there. <clears throat> All right, thank you so much for voting. And I'm going to share here. 
Yes, you can benchmark your energy consumption. You can help reduce, <clears throat> help calculate for, for the various potential solutions. And hey, you can, with an audit, help populate the utility workbook a lot quicker. So very valid benefits as well. Let me get back to the presentation here. Uh, any questions at all before I keep going? I know I've been saying a good amount of stuff here. All right, well, let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk a, a tiny amount about light and health. And we're gonna start with tunable white or circadian lighting. Tunable white lighting is the ability to change the color temperature of a fixture's output from a warm yellow to white to the cool blues, as you see in the image on the right-hand side here. <clears throat> and this, this uh, color change is supposed to match what we call the black body radiator curve, how a black body burns along a radiator curve. Uh, and again, from a warm yellow to white to a cool blue. Uh, while research is ongoing on this specific technology and application, using a tunable white system at least prepares a space for any possible eventualities on their research outcomes. So, you know, we, we don't know for certain or for 100% certainty what applications of tunable white are going to be optimal for our health. But however, having a tunable white system that can be controlled with network lighting controls, regardless of what those outcomes are, you'll be able to control that technology as you need. <clears throat> um, customers can choose full bore circadian systems with scheduling and color tuning throughout the day. These systems were once very specialty items, but they're now a bit more mainstream the last couple of years. <clears throat> Some systems use two pairs of zero to 10 volt wires, uh, one pair to control the intensity of light from 0% to 100, and the other pair to control what they call the correlated color temperature. Uh, just to get a reference, when you have you know 2700 Kelvin correlated co color temperature or CCT, you're saying to have a warm yellow. If you have, for example, a 6500 Kelvin CCT, that's a very cool blue. <clears throat> The period of the internal biological clock is entrained, we say, by different signals, such as the organism's endocrine and behavioral rhythms and their synchronized environmental cues. This, uh, this entrainment and, and is still under review. Some folks think that blue spike in, in most LED products is physically and psychologically damaging. Other people feel that the low intensity of the electric sources, because it's a, a small intensity of this electric light, means that there's not a problem. We are going to look at a, a few variables here that we see that affect circadian entrainment. <clears throat> and again, circadian entrainment is that internal biological clock that secretes your melatonin and serotonin to either wake you up or put you to sleep. Uh, and, and big consideration on tunable white lighting and circadian lighting come for, for day active workers. People that go outside, they can reset their circadian rhythm. Uh, shift workers, for example, may, people that are, that are working night shift, second shift, they don't, they don't have that luxury and, and their circadian cycles are somewhat <clears throat> affected by this. So let's look a little bit at these variables, starting with intensity. Um, how much light is, is getting you at the eyes. And here we're talking about your vertical foot candles. So foot candles, we usually see horizontal on a task plane, be it your desk, be it your conference room table. <clears throat> we're talking about vertical foot candles here because it's, it's your eye. You know, Ideally for a seated person, what is a foot candle at four feet from the ground for a seated person? If you see, for example, uh, the person at the right hand sitting here, they're not getting a love, enough light to trigger their circadian entrainment. And we would recommend this person go outside and reset their cycle. <clears throat> Distribution as a variable for circadian entrainment is, is important as well. Direction that the light is, is uh, or the angle of the light is hitting your eyes, that matters as well. Uh, the more impactful angles are what we call above 90 degree above nadir, nadir being, you know, down or zero, zenith being the top, the 180 
uh, mark of that. But uh, everything that's hitting you above 90 degrees from from below, from, from the ground, is gonna be the more impactful uh, light that is going to be affecting your circadian entrainment. <clears throat> Spectral power distribution more than the color temperature is gonna be a main factor that affects your circadian entrainment. On the right, you see gonna be the different wavelengths and the parts of the spectrum represented in fixtures or different light sources, you know, from daylight to your to your cool white LEDs, you see that large blue spike, uh, as opposed to a warm white LED where you don't see the, the blue, the blue uh, as prominent as before. <clears throat> the ability to control that tunable white is the way you adjust that uh, that the spectral power distribution. Uh, and note that you we don't only talk about visual light here. The eyes, uh, and this is a recent discovery, they have non-visual photoreceptors, those are the IP RGCs, and they benefit <clears throat> from the spectral power distribution even in the non-visual light wavelength. The dose, duration of, of, of uh, what concoction of light, you know, what intensity and what color temperature, and for what time, uh, is going to affect your circadian entrainment. So again, for those classrooms that don't have windows, <clears throat> that's going to be key to give give the students as well as the teachers some semblance of the outside. So timing, uh, what time are you being affected by a circadian stimulus? Ideally, uh, you have higher light levels in the mornings, uh, and that, that's an uh, and, and, and that's kind of like what research is, is pointing it towards. Insufficient, insufficient daytime lighting signals have been shown to increase the likelihood of night owl tendencies in students. And this obviously is gonna impact the academic performance and often result in students feeling excessively sleepy during school hours. So again, that, that's insufficient daytime light signals is gonna cause you more of your light, uh, night owls. And lastly, your photobiological history. These are, you know, your visual stimuli that we are associating with over time. So what's that pattern over time? What is your, your, your lighting effects of your body? Uh, and this builds what they call your circadian entrainment profile. Uh, in 2018 and 19, the Department of Energy, along with uh, what we call their Pacific Northwest National Laboratories, their, their Pacific Northwest uh, uh, boots in the ground arm. They did a study uh, in three classrooms about tunable white systems and polling students and teachers how they felt throughout the day. They used uh, the wall control that you see here on the right to, to change the color temperature of the light from your yellow to your white to your blue, as well as the intensity. Um, they used, what they say, uh, and, and you can see here at the bottom right what uh scenes they were using the most if they use you know power on by default that they had a calm scene that they have a general scene they were using so what they found a couple of things as after running this study they found that dimming was a primary benefit and and controlling the color temperature was more so secondary so dimming was a great way to change different cues uh the different activities. Hey, you're going to recess. It had a different dim factor. You're, you're coming back from lunch. You have a different factor. We're going to the presentation. You have a different dimming level, and 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 all these. And the dimming was seen as the primary cue changer, but seeing the color temperature was also a great secondary benefit. Uh, the systems also saw between 25 to 57 percent energy savings because in their past fluorescent system, they just had lights on to 100. If you see on the right hand side here, only with an, the new network lighting control system could they dim their lights for different uh, applications. And we say lighting controls to the rescue because we don't know what the optimal mix of the variables is going to be as research may change. However, NLC can make those changes with simple reprogramming. And just implementing your network lighting control system will allow you to control tunable white regardless of what the research says the best mix is. Uh, a little 
another poll here. If we can select the variables that affect circadian entrainment. Please select the variables that affect circadian entrainment. And again, it should have been uh, allowing more than one option, but, but sorry that the polls here are only allowing one option. So thank you for those that are voting. What are those variables that affect your circadian entrainment? All right, three more seconds. And I appreciate this because, let me close it and share it. <clears throat> so correlated color temperature, we shift it to control tunable white lighting, but interestingly enough, it is not one of those main variables that affect it. Spectral power distribution is more so the variable that affects your circadian entrainment. Uh, color temperature is just the way that we shift that, that the color temperature and lighting, but what? But the actual variable is the spectral power distribution. Watching forward here, seeing if there's any questions, and uh, I see there is not. So let's talk about some 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 applications in in school spaces. And uh, if you ever seen South Park, they have a an episode where they they have a network lighting control system and a building management system in their school called IntelliLink, and everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. So if you you know want to laugh for twenty minutes, IntelliLink uh, in South Park is is some of the best things you can you can watch for for this application. But uh, let's talk about low low hanging fruit. Let's talk about stairwells, corridors, and garages. They're excellent locations for luminaire level lighting controls, even if they're outdoors. <clears throat> and big stress here, we want to consider dimming rather than what most people do in, in stairwell and in, in corridors and parking garages, which is uh, checkerboard switching in, in some way, shape, or form. But uh, these spaces, uh, and most codes will, will go by this, they'll, they'll want you to automatically reduce the lighting power by not less than 50% when a space is vacant for 15 minutes or 30 for garages referring to code. But when there is uh, occupancy, we wanna restore light to full or something more than half, you know, more than 50% when there is occupancy. <clears throat> when we're looking at stairwells, uh, one fixture per landing is recommended. A great application is that during operating hours, you have a stair illumination be at a background level, you know, a low 25, 30% intensity, just to ensure that there's safety there. <clears throat> as soon as the stairwell sensors detect occupancy, you have at least, that, at least that landing and that above and below to a bright level over 50%. Uh, if you look here, this is on the bottom right, you'll see an application with network lighting zone based lower lighting controls. You'll have a separate corner mounted occupancy sensor uh, telling you know the lights at that landing what to do. But you can also always have uh, LLLC approaches where you'll have sensors embedded and, and maybe not even LLLC. Some of these fixtures can come with just a motion sensor uh, and, and they can be paired together with other fixtures just so that an entire st stairwell can turn on if only one landing sees occupancy. And again, that is more so for safety than not. Uh, corridors, we see some sensors that have an ability to have a like a beam that is going to have a very long range of coverage. Some are even boasting 1500 uh, feet. They throw a beam for coverage in a stairwell. Um, however, when you have corridors in L shape, sometimes it's better to have an LLC application because uh, this type of sensor will, will not, if, if it's located here, it will only see up to the L shape start and won't be able to know if people are coming in the space here. So you can always add an additional sensor per L shape or have luminar level lighting control fixtures in your corridors. <clears throat> Uh, and, and in schools, wall stations in your quarters are not going to be as common, but they can always be there optionally for, for people that want to control the illumination in a corridor, but again, not commonly seen. <clears throat> for restrooms, uh, sometimes it's just okay to add a standalone control. You know, you, a sensor switch that just 
And by the way, if you can tell the difference here, this sensor on the left-hand side is, is an ultrasonic sensor. Those are the sonar waves that's where they come from. And on the right-hand side, this is a, sorry, and, and, and this is a passive infrared uh, sensor. So you have both a, du a dual tech sensor here pretty much. And this is an only a passive infrared sensor, sensor dimmer where you can uh, put it again in the bathroom and it's not gonna communicate with your system, but sometimes it's all you need. For a multi-stall bathroom, you can have, for example, here we have one load controller for both the fixtures on top of the stalls as well as the vanity. A uh, way this can be better is by separating the vanity mirror light into its own zone with its own load controller. But you see, again, sensors, in order to see the coverage uh, on your stalls, these are passive infrared sensors. They're not the ultrasonic sonar ones. They wanna have them on top in the middle of the stalls just to get that visibility and that coverage. What about emergency? <clears throat> Bear with me here. What about emergency? Emergency, the lighting was uh, provided by a constant 24 hour on hot circuit. You know, you would just have lights be on the entire year. <clears throat> that's what used to be emergency lighting, but that's no, lo no longer allowed in most codes. Uh, we have now what we call UL 924 devices. They provide an easy option for controlling architectural lighting that may be used for emergency or egress lighting. Uh, now we expect these devices to operate the same alongside normal powered load controllers. Let's see an example in the video here. So on this example, you have both an emergency fixture and a normal fixture. The emergency one's the top one right here. The normal one is the, is the bottom one. <clears throat> and they are on automatically at the same time. Oh. So they turn on and they turn off. They dim at the same time. So let's see what happens when we turn them on and dim them down a little bit. <clears throat> now we are going to simulate that normal power is going to be shut off. So they're both at a dim level and we're going to turn off normal power. The UL 924 device working alongside load transfer device is going to go on to full bright when emergency happens. But when normal power is restored, both lights remember the last level they were at that was at that dim level and they can again be controlled again together. So the idea is when normal power goes away, the emergency fixtures go to full bright. When normal power is restored, they can operate together again. <clears throat> Some more, what we call this middle hanging fruit. Uh, in this simple office example, you can see how a zone-based NLC approach has a great more amount of hardware and considerations than it would be for an LLLC design. Uh, see how you have you know, your daylight sensor, occupancy sensor, load controller for the fixtures, whereas in uh, LLLC approach for an office, you only need your fixture and the wall control. And you you something you here even have the option, hey, receptacle control for some of those phantom loads. But again, one, two, three hardware components plus the four fixtures, and here it's all baked into one. Uh, open office just expands a little bit, uh, but the idea remains the same. You have you know your occupancy coverage, you have load controllers for separate zones, and you have your daylight sensor. If you see a DZ here, that stands for your daylight zone one. Uh, on Then beyond that daylight zone, you have daylight zone two that are also both responding to this daylight sensor here. On the right-hand side, you have an example of a narrative sequence of operation. Hey, what happens? You have, what type of lighting do you have? What happens on occupancy considerations? What is gonna be the daylight harvesting operations? What are your wall stations going to be doing? Are there additional features such as dual line 24 emergency power measurement? So sequence of operations is a great way to understand the control intent for a space. 
break rooms in, in schools will usually have corner mount sensors because they'll have some vertical obstructions or you just wanna see a periphery of, of a square room. And sometimes ceiling sensors won't be able to capture everything when you have vertical obstructions. Uh, another example of a sequence of operation there, just, just when it comes to occupancy. In more like larger or, or not low hanging fruit, but in more architecturally developed spaces, it may not be as simple to include luminar level lighting control technology in these spaces. Uh, for example, when you talk about decorative style of fixtures, some of these require phase control and you'll have like a, either a forward phase or a reverse phase load controller. Uh, those are your, your magnetic low voltage or electronic low voltage uh, transformers. And, and again, luminar level lighting control in, in decorative fixtures is not as ubiquitous, is not as mainstream. So that's when you're starting to then go a zone based network lighting control approach. In classroom, in this classroom example, we highlight the separation of the illumination over the student desks. So you see the student desks have the troughers from the whiteboard or the blackboard. Uh, they are going to be separate zones. However, we separate uh, daylight as well. You know, daylight zone one, daylight zone two. Uh, and an LL, and again, the idea is that each zone is going to have its own load controller. In a luminar level lighting control, you can group each fixture any way you want to make your own zones and you can reconfigure them. That's also another benefit of luminar level lighting control. Let's say you had one zone, zone two, zone three, and if you wanted to change that, all you had to do was go on the commissioning tool and pre-program what the fixtures are gonna do. You don't need to go into the ceiling to rezone the space with luminar level lighting controls. Uh, again, the same, the same classroom with many zones, see how you have your passive infrared sensors, uh, you have load controllers by the whiteboard, you have a load controller by the teacher's desk, a load control, uh, a wall station at the entrance. Um, so very many ways to outfit a space and you have in this space two, two daylight sensors, one here and another one here because there's more windows. and and. Yes, without LLLC, that is going to mean that we're going to need uh, we're going to need a daylight row, daylight zones for this sensor as well as daylight rows for that sensor. It's going to require a lot more wiring. Uh, when you use laboratories in schools, rather than having uh, ceiling mounted 360 degree sensors, it'd be best to have uh, wall sensors because of vertical obstructions. And just as we said before. Uh, territorial reps and manufacturers should be involved in your projects very early from a conceptual point of view. They know their stuff. They have all these best practice guides and, and the majority of the drawings that we saw just now came from different reps and manufacturers that put them together to see best practices. An element that we want to ensure we stress is uh, commissioning and the difference between commissioning and startup. Uh, Commissioning is a whole process where you involve even third-party commissioning agents. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and this lasts beyond the system installation and programming. It includes, uh, commissioning includes optimization, uh, developing documents for final reports. Starting up a system simply means how it wakes up or when it comes online for the first time and that what that programming is when you power it on for the first time. That's what startup is. But we, when we really think commissioning is a, is a longer process, not just programming a system once and leaving it, but it includes, includes that optimization, return visits by a commissioning agent. Uh, again, the startup is just when the system wakes up, what is the initial programming you're going to give it? Important and often overlooked is to commission the occupants. We want to let the various user groups know, you know, faculty, staff, uh, custodial staff, whatever the case may be, ideally ahead of time and with their buy-in, uh, the proposed lighting control changes in your space. User groups like teachers can help determine the sequence of operation or even what the engraving on the wall stations is gonna be for the project. It'll allow them more control and having, you know, their buy-in ahead of time will help uh, make them happier with, with these proposed projects. 
what's going on, making sure anyone has any questions. Again, you can ask questions in chat. So that's questions. We're gonna move on a little bit a little bit on, on some financing topics. Uh, the connected prospectus for buildings. Uh, the National Institute of Building Sciences did a 30-year study cost of a building where you know your design and construction, the maintenance costs, the overhead to rent did not that they just it just paled in comparison on this office building to what uh, personnel salaries were and, and not just personnel salaries for your entire HR operations, your salaries, your benefits, productivity. So you really invest in people when it comes to buildings. Uh, yes, uh, rent and, and utility costs, and, and they, they're high prices, but they pale in comparison to the productivity of a human. <clears throat> We have what we call the 1990 rule. It's very similar to the 33300. It's just not uh, patented or trademarked. <laughs> uh, but a building, you say you spend 1% uh, of, of your budget on energy and resources. That includes you know, your, your lighting, your HVAC, energy, water, waste, and the use of resources that include lighting, heating, cooling, plug loads. So 1% of your budget for the building is spent on your energy and resources. 9% of your building's budget is spent, is spent on what we call space and layout, that is rent, overhead, the space use efficiency, that reflect the workflow and offer an optimum environment for individual tasks, employee interaction, team building, operations, customer service. So how the space is used is about 9% of your building's budget, the layout of your space, <clears throat> and that includes your rent and your overhead. 90% of the budget in a building goes to wellness and productivity, uh, employee wellness and productivity, including acoustics, visual comfort, thermal and indoor air quality, the amenities that a building has to help people stay engaged and active, and measures that help improve the employee's health, comfort, and work-life balance. That is where the majority, the 90% majority of your building costs come. You can even double in revenue and opportunities when it comes to unexpected benefits of highly interconnected building systems, their devices and sensors and delivering device level data that can be aggregated into incredibly valuable real-time business operations data. So you again have smart devices in the ceiling that are capturing data. You have power in the ceiling with many IoT uh, potential applications that you can flip on the switch for. And all this data and all these features can add uh, 100% of that budget into revenue opportunities. With tenant, with, with people that are decision makers and stakeholders, it is important to discuss the cost of waiting. You know, you run the risk of utilities running out of funds to incentivize your product or give you rebates. You're going to be continuing to overspend on energy if you don't, uh, over, for, if you forgo doing your lighting products or you're going to wait. Uh, you continue overspending on human capital, sending your facility technicians to, to repair a lamp or a ballast or, or, or replace them, sorry. Uh, equipment continues to end, to near its end of life uh, operations. Uh, it's important again to listen to stakeholder objections, but there is a cost of waiting to implement network lighting control projects in schools. I want to talk a little bit about some of the metrics that we commonly see in these projects, but uh, a simple payback is a metric that we see, where a simple payback is a formula where you have your initial investment divided by the return that you have, uh, and you'll get a number of years that you're going to get your system paid back. In a very simple terms, if you spend $100 on a new system or a new project, and every year you're going to get $40 back from savings, you're going to spend about two and a half years paying back that initial investment. And that's ultimately what simple payback is. Hey, what, what does my system cost? What are going to be my energy savings after that? And uh, how long is it going to take for the system to pay for itself? <clears throat> a more complex but a fuller formula is below, where you have the total cost of the project is going to be the cost of material, labor, and services minus your rebates, because your rebates can take care of some of this, and you're going to divide this, this cost 
by your energy savings and your deferred maintenance savings per year. Way better than a simple payback metric, although a lot more complex, so those are your con and cons, is what we call the life cycle analysis. And that is taking the entire cost for the life of the system, be it 10, 15, 20 years, where you have everything from your initial cost, everything from, from the implementation, installation, programming, uh, operational costs, your energy usage, the maintenance for the system, even the disposal. Uh, so it's better to paint a story on the life cycle of a system than just, hey, how quickly are we going to cover our upfront costs? A life cycle uh, tells, uh, analysis tells a story. We're not necessarily going to go into this simplified example as much, but uh, just important to note that, hey, you had your, your lighting system cost this much on the top left here. You had enough rebates and incentives to lower the total cost to this much of $50,000. And this $50,000, how are we going to tell the story? Say, hey, we have energy savings, we have maintenance savings. And every year you're going to see from those savings, it's going to, again, draw into paying for that initial outflow. What's important to note is that we want to ensure that we communicate with stakeholders on the financial metric language they prefer. Some people want to see, hey, what's the net present value of my project? You know, what is my project over 10 years worth today? And in this example where you have, you know, about 10 years of, our, of, of, of savings and it, you increase these a little bit because as you get more aggressive with the control strategies, it makes sense there are more savings as time goes by. But what is the worth today of this 10 year life cycle? That's what we're measuring here with net present value. Uh, simple payback is always good to have noting that it takes a bit more than three years to, to pay back the system, but hey, you, you have it for seven more years, you're going to get pure savings back. And uh, ROI is another good metric to, to return on investments, another good metric to measure your, your financial analysis on. For those customers that are more budget sensitive, there is a service called uh, lighting as a service or energy efficiency as a service. It's a business model that's becoming a bit more common these days where there are no upfront capital costs for the owners of buildings or schools. Uh, the implementers pay for everything, equipment, commissioning, maintenance, and what the implementers then get is going to be monthly payments or subscription-like payments from the savings you realize by having the new system. Because you have a new system, be it lights, control system, and LEDs, and, and network lighting controls, you're going to save a lot of energy in your utility bill. So from those savings, you're going to pay the implementer that fronted all the hardware and labor to put in that system. Seattle City Light has a pilot going on right now, their energy efficiency as a service pilot, where Seattle will take care of, uh, will be working with the implementers to take care of the upfront cost. And the idea is that you have, you, when you have a new system, it's gonna be more efficient, you're gonna have those savings. What happens is uh, from these savings, the customer is gonna stay what they call bill neutral. They're gonna continue paying as if they did not have the savings. And from the savings that are realized, that's what you pay the implementer until the system is paid off. Once the system is paid off, you have both a new system in your space, as well as all those savings realized. Um, a little bit back to mentioning the Trade Ally Network Northwest. They uh, have what they call a field guide where they put a great amount of uh, lighting tips and tools, HVAC tips and tools, and even uh, some sales uh, tips and tools such as, like, hey, if stakeholders have objections, here's a counter suggestion. So just wanted to shout out, it's a great resource, especially when you're looking at schools and especially when you're looking at those sales conversations. Uh, hey, I don't have a budget for an upgrade. Discuss the cost of waiting, demonstrate lifetime economics. So again, look for the field guide by the Trade Ally Network Northwest. I wanted to also bring awareness to a study that Nia did uh, earlier this year, January 7th of this year. It's the incremental cost of luminaire level lighting controls. They measured they, from, from different types of systems, 
how much more money is it to have a fixture with LLLC? What's the baseline and what's the fixture with LLLC technology in it? What is that incremental cost? And, and they studied different uh, schools, offices, and healthcare spaces for this, uh, and mainly looking at troughers and linear fixtures. Generally estimate, you know, 35 to $75 increase when adding luminaire level lighting controls to a fixture cost. They, in this study, subdivided systems into what they call clever, clever hybrid, or smart, where a clever system you know, some simple controls, some fine tuning. And here you see examples of network lighting control manufacturers with their system and how they were subdivided into with each category. Uh, Clever Hybrid has all the control strategies and those are, you know, your high end trim, time clock, occupancy, uh, demand response can be there as well. And smart systems are those that have, they, they consider them with the ex extended IoT functionality and, and, and additional features. So the top right here, we see on 2020, the average incremental cost of adding luminaire level lighting controls. So for clever systems, like a, almost like a $50 adder for LLC, for smart systems, a $90 adder, which makes sense. There are more advanced and more expensive. Uh, just wanted to highlight the smart system and how they broke it down. Uh, how they break it down. So they have, hey, a fixture without LLLC is gonna cost you around $90. A fixture with LLLC for a smart system is gonna cost you $171 on average. And then they went further on, hey, what's the programming cost? What's the processor or the brain of the system gonna cost? Uh, and when they talk about the incremental cost, it's like, hey, you know the total incremental cost for adding LLLC to a fixture, it's about this on average. So it's a great study to have. If you haven't seen it, it's good to note. And it's good to know that this is what you can expect on the different costs, adding luminaire level lighting controls to different kinds of systems. Uh, I think this is the, the last or before, the, or this is the last poll, what are good, good strategies, good discussions to combat budget shortages? What are good tips and tricks or discussions to have when a stakeholder is telling you, hey, uh, we cannot implement a project. It is out of our budget scope. You can uh, help by participating here. What are good strategies to combat budget shortages? And thank you for those who are voting. And I think this one was done well, where it allows more than one answer. All right, thank you for those that voted. Close it out. And yes, we can discuss cost of waiting. We can discuss non-energy benefits and how they impact the life cycle of the system. Uh, I, I, I am against value engineering the projects, but hey, that could be a strategy too. Or suggest lighting as a service like financial models. Very good stuff. Thank you for participating, guys. Let's keep going on here. Um, any questions? I see there are none. So what are some good strategies to keep this simple or to keep Good communication between system components and stakeholders. Uh, in many projects, it's common to see a fixture schedule. Uh, it is also great to ask for, if it doesn't exist, a control schedule. You know, the different components for a network lighting control system, each having a designation and a description, it'll be great to recognize them, especially if there are floor plans. Um, so always ask for a control schedule if possible. Sequence of operation, we've alluded to it uh, a few moments, and it is how you communicate the design intent of a network lighting control system. And this can make a difference between a great lighting project and one you'd soon forget. Uh, it is that the SOO, the sequence of operation, is the vital link between how a system is designed and how it gets set up. Um, you have different uh, methods of having a sequence of operation. You can have it a simple matrix where, hey, by space type, what are the control strategies that we're gonna have? You can have narratives and you can have, you know, more complex matrices that have values instead of Xs 
uh, and you can pair floor plans with different uh, narratives or matrices for a sequence of operations as well. One line documents. These are important documents, more so for, for facility professionals or the implementers, the installers, the programmers. Uh, there are more technical drawings that outline the architecture of a system and they diagram how components are linked to each other. These are more so for implementers again to review, uh, but can serve as a great resource for anyone looking to understand how the system components interact with each other and see their installation locations, see circuiting information. So a great large do uh, document to be, to be um, aware about. Again, key for tenants, we mentioned it before, wall stations. For a typical end user, the more critical element of a lighting control system is going to be the wall station because that's how they mainly interface with the system. These are usually switches and dimmers where, where people are going to, again, press buttons to change the lighting. The wall station functionality will likely dictate the user's experience with the control system. Uh, traditionally, Tenants don't interact with a new NLC system half the time if they don't have meaningful engraving. Uh, last year, Lighting Design Lab conducted a study on, on wall stations and we learned that people prefer multi-scene wall station with specific engraving rather than you know, your scene one, scene two, scene three, but rather meeting, presentation, video, as well as dedicated raise and lower buttons. Those three main items seem to be where tenants appreciated the most on wall stations. Multi-scene, so you have multiple buttons doing different things, specific engraving, and dedicated raise and lower buttons. Important to note, many projects go unengraved, and that's because it's a scope gray area. People don't know who is going to be in charge of engraving the space. And most manufacturers offer engraving services for free on, on projects, but it's sometimes the difficulty comes with no one knows what the different buttons should have. And that's because uh, sometimes they don't get user groups involved, like in school, like teachers don't get involved and, or, or the staff doesn't get involved. So people won't necessarily have a buy-in on how a space gets engraved. And I say this to ensure that, hey, when you're looking at these projects, you either ask the right, right questions or ask for, hey, how can we get our project engraved? Um, key for facility professionals and schools is gonna be the configuration tools. When a project is done, uh, the implementers will usually hand off a commissioning tool, be it a tablet or an app, a phone app, uh, or a computer program to the facility technicians and say, hey, the system is yours now. Uh, you can monitor it, control it, see diagnostics, see dashboards. Uh, so it's gonna be key for facility professionals to number one, get training on, on how to use this, as well as the tool itself should be, should be simple enough you know configuration tools they're great when they provide an ordinal or logically followed process where they have visual confirmation of the settings that are being implemented there's tooltip helps there's uh video assistance if they need to know how to do something there's a video about it but a lot of these apps are really confusing making facility professionals need to call the factory on hey how do i change this setting again and that again uh, disrupts the flow of the building and has to get other people involved. Uh, note, not every system uses an app, such as the Cree SmartCast system will use a remote where, hey, that one button can get you 70% of the way there where you wanna be, when you want your system to be programmed and then fine tune with some of the buttons. But just note the configuration tool most likely can use a, a tablet or phone app, but not everyone uses that. I mentioned, hey, ensure that facility training uh, facility professionals are trained in how the system works. Sometimes in project, in larger projects that have construction documents, the Division 26 is, is that a lighting control or lighting system specification. And a lot of times we're gonna require that there's gonna be training even for, even, uh, for smaller systems included in the construction documents. But if a project is small and does not have these, it is also always important to ask the facility professionals be trained in the commissioning tool of a system. Uh, when it comes to warranty, there are warranty issues are, are in some flux across the lighting industry. 
you know, five and 10 year warranties have become commonplace, but they are often offered by companies that are not even in business for five and 10 years. So caution is warranted. If something seems too good to be true, it probably is. Um, I wanted to see a last call on questions. Anybody here? Well, thank you so much. It's been a great presentation. Uh, wanted to close us out here then with a few words from us. Uh, wanted to Can note. Oh yeah, please go ahead, Katie. <laughs> I'm waiting for the screen to update. It still has Dilbert for me. <laughs> Do you want to advance one more, see if that works? Uh, it should be at the upcoming event. Let me know if you don't see it. Now it is. All oh, right, cool. cool. Yes. So um, we're going to have a presentation from our colleagues here at City Light on a very cool microgrid project that's going in um, at the Miller Community Center. Uh, it's a quick one. Um, it, it, it's just interesting how they're doing solar and battery storage there for a microgrid and control. Um, and then if you attended any of our code series from earlier this year, um, in June, we're, we're bringing Dwayne back and he's going to do a series on heat pumps um, and as related to the code updates. So don't want to miss those. I think we've got the topics and dates figured out. Um, but don't quite have all the pieces put together yet. Um, watch our newsletter for when that gets um, released to register for. And again, there'll be a recording of this as, as well as this slide deck um, available on our website. And there's Armando's contact information if you think of a question later on um, or email us at our lighting design lab at seattle.gov email address as well. And that is all. Remember to take the survey at the end um, and sign up for that um, May 27th webinar. It should be very interesting. All right, thank you everybody and have a great day.